So wonderful, wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, we just had a very wonderful panel discussion about autonomous driving. So right now, suppose we are driving a self-driving car to travel, travel from a physical world to a virtual world. The virtual world is called the video games. So we are about to have the next session today. It's about AI in games. Although it's the last session today, but definitely this is the most interesting one because everyone loves video games. So it's my honor to introduce the moderator today, uh, Joanne Chen. So Joanne is a partner of uh, Foundation Capital. She focuses on the investing data-driven companies. Before that, she was an angel investor for two years at Hyde Park Angels. She began her uh, career as an engineer at Cisco and later co-founded a mobile gaming company. Joanne received her PhD, uh, MBA from uh, Chicago Booth and a bachelor's degree from uh, UC Berkeley. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Joanne Chen to moderate the session, AI in Games. Thank you so much. I'm particularly excited because I've been a gamer for quite a long time, so uh, very excited to be here. Well, first we have, um, I want to introduce Yuan Dong Tian, uh, who is a research scientist at Facebook Re AI Research. He's working on deep reinforcement learning applied to games. Uh, he's the lead researcher for Dark Forest, which is Facebook's computer Go project. Uh, he's also spent time on the Google self-driving team. Uh, he's going to share some of his learnings at Facebook, uh, and I'm very excited uh, to introduce him. Please welcome Yuan Dong. Thanks for, for coming and uh, for attending this uh, talk. So today I'm going to talk about uh, AI in games, uh, achievements and challenges. So I'm going to talk about like, uh, uh, what is, uh, why we need to do AIs uh, in games, uh, why uh, we want to use game environment uh, to advance our AI technology, and also I will talk about our, uh, some of our work uh, in this field. So can you go to the next slide? So uh, I think uh, everyone knows like, uh, uh, what the game is. If you ask people uh, who are 10 years old, and who want to, uh, what are the most interesting activity they want to be involved, and they probably will say games. Uh, the reason why AI as a game is interesting is because of two reasons. The first of all, uh, it's, it has like very deep strategies. For example, uh, if you play the game of chess or the game of Go, uh, then you have to sit there and think for like hours to find like interesting strategies uh, throughout the, the place. And uh, the second part that why game is interesting is because Nowadays, the game is becoming more and more realistic. Uh, and uh, uh, if we ask people, as a person who actually uh, have never played a game before, uh, what it can say about these figures, these fancy images, what uh, will be like, oh, this seems to be like real images. Actually, they are not. They are rendered uh, from computer graphics. So I think uh, in the near future, we're going to see like a more and more uh, realistic images from all these games until that they are actually uh, more realistic than the real uh, virtual real world. So uh, using game as a vehicle of AI uh, has a lot of benefits. So the first of all, it will give you an like, infinite amount of data. Uh, so if you people have uh, if people have tried actually work on uh, uh, work on like uh, AI before, then people will actually know that one of the biggest obstacle uh, of AI is its data. If there's no data, then any algorithm that is very fancy and very working. Uh, it, with like lots of data will not work well. But for game, it actually gives you this kind of like a room or this kind of environment that you can explore and you can find, you can basically get all the data with fully uh, labeled uh, information. And this is basically like uh, all free of charge. And uh, second is uh, if you use uh, the game environment as the data source, then usually you can run it uh, faster than the real world. Uh, so this is, uh, this is very important because currently all the, inf all the uh, uh, algorithms actually are very, 
data hungry, and you need a lot of data to fill in uh, the model so that it will work well. And uh, thirdly, uh, of course, uh, we want, as a scientific experiment, we want to uh, make the environment to be controllable and uh, replicable. And for real world, it's going to be a hard problem because there are so many uh, unexpected factors in your experiment that you cannot control all of them. And all these are uh, not repeatable uh, if you cannot control them well. But for game environment, things are different because you can uh, run the same environment again with the same random seed and see it will become the same. And you will get like a very repeatable uh, patterns. And uh, there's a few other benefits from a game environment. For example, uh, you can, uh, you basically uh, are less concerned about uh, the safety and ethical concerns. So, for example, if you want to try to uh, run a self-driving car on the, in the real world, then things have become a little bit harder, especially uh, from the uh, political, from the uh, government point of view. But if you run self-driving car in a virtual environment, uh, things will become much easier. You just like uh, driving, uh, and you just like try different approaches in that. Uh, but there's actually no free lunch for sure. Uh, so uh, if you use gaming environment as the uh, vehicle, as like a one data source for AI, there's a, a few a weakness, a, a few concerns that we need to consider. First, uh, we still have the, uh, for all the uh, uh, algorithm that we have been using, it's pretty slow and they are data, very data efficient. So even if you have a, lot, uh, a strong game environment, a game environment that can run like a thousand times faster, uh, then the real world, uh, we are still facing the problem that uh, the algorithms are quite stupid and uh, it takes a long time for them to get the training well. So if people have tried uh, all the environment like Atali, uh, Atala, uh, like uh, OpenAI Gene, then uh, we actually, see what I would actually see here uh, is uh, we train this uh, 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 algorithm for like a million of games and gradually uh, this agent began to uh, become a little bit smart and uh, try to understand what's going on in the game. But if we ask a 10 years old to play these games, like in maybe in like 10 minutes, they actually know what's going on. And things become much faster from a human brain's point of view. So we still need uh, algorithm advancement uh, in that direction. And a second, uh, uh, if you, even if you use game environment, uh, you still need a, lot of a lot of resources. Here I'll actually show you a story, show you a story about like AlphaGo. Uh, last uh, August, I basically come to uh, Boston uh, to visit, like, uh, to attend the U.S. Go Congress, uh, in which we actually met with people uh, from uh, our Go team. Uh, uh, I basically asked about like how many GPUs they have been using to train the AlphaGo project, uh, uh, and uh, I'm basically saying that uh, how many they 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 want to use it, and. Uh, uh, the leader engineer, uh, Arja Huang, says it's pretty confidential. I cannot say anything. And uh, I basically say, uh, I, we are using like 80 to 90 GPUs to train the models. Arja goes smi uh, and Arja Huang smiles and said, oh, maybe less than 1%. So which basically means that it's, they are using like uh, more than like 10K GPUs uh, to train their models. So uh, instead of using a lot of supervised training data, what they want to use is uh, a lot of resources that to generate data. So this is also a trade-off here. So there's no free lunch uh, if you're using a uh, uh, game environment. So and uh, the third obstacle here uh, is uh, we usually like can train very good models from abstract games, but how to transfer these models into real world that is uh, scary and shitty and has a lot of corner cases is really a problem. Uh, so and uh, finally, for now, there's so many environments, so it's very hard to benchmark the progress. So we are still in a long way to achieve like a superhuman performance in uh, tasks that are, are very close to the real world. So uh, before we actually come to the actual contribution, uh, we are uh, here. I want to like briefly discuss about like how game AI works. Uh, so first of all, I want to uh, make sure that everyone understand this basic fact that that is even with a super 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 computer, it's very hard. It's not possible to search the entire space. Uh, so, so in order to make the game AI work, so what we should do uh, is to uh, decompose this search space into two different stages. First of all, uh, if we have uh, initial uh, location, initial states of the game, then what we can do is to do an extensive search from the initial game state. But at some point, uh, this search has to be stopped. Uh, and then an evaluation function has to be involved to directly give you an estimate uh, of the game state. 
You combine the two and you get a search algorithm that is uh, fairly strong, but at the same time, computational feasible. So in order to uh, design these two uh, components, there are a lot of things we need to consider. First of all, in order to design how we can do extensive search, it really depends on uh, what kind of game we are discussing about, right? For example, if for uh, chess, for checker, that has fewer, uh, uh, only like a few actions per move, uh, then uh, we can actually emulate all possible states, um, and then up to some kind of fixed steps. And with these fixed steps, uh, we actually know everything about the game, and then once we find promising moves, we can use that promising move to start another search. So that's why they are using alpha beta pooling plus uh, iterative deepening. But on the other side, if we talk about Go, uh, talk about like even StarCraft, in that case, we have so many moves that we can try at each iteration, and it's actually impractical to expand the entire tree uh, from the beginning to the end, even up to maybe just three or four depths. So this is actually give people a difficult time in uh, making this algorithm, make this uh, game working well. So it's and, until very recent that people discover that uh, we can actually use deep convolutional network uh, that uh, can selectively find the uh, uh, most promising moves by the game situation. And this basically enable uh, uh, people that uh, we can actually use a deep root network to uh, play the game to go of go and can achieve professional performance and even superhuman performance. Okay. So uh, on the other side, uh, how we can design uh, the evaluation function is, uh, is also depend on the games. For example, for chess, people may just check uh, how many cheap pieces you have versus how many pieces your opponents have, and you do some abstraction. Do some uh, subtraction, and you will get a rough idea about what's going on. But for Go, it's very hard to estimate uh, what is the game situation is. So this is also one of the reasons why it is very hard. And until recent, we actually uh, find that uh, we're using a convolutional network uh, can give you a very good performance uh, estimate of the current situation. And uh, for poker and StarCraft, things are different because even if, uh, if uh, because these two games are incomplete information, which basically means that you do not really know what's going on on your opponent's side, so you cannot do a simple math to get uh, the advantage or disadvantage that you currently have. So in these two cases, you really need to predict what's going on on the opponent based on what he has played in order to estimate the game situation. So uh, 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 this all, all these two components actually being modeled uh, like uh, maybe uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they are very, very classic uh, artificial intelligence problem. So what's new uh, in the current trend? The current trend actually give people a different approach to model uh, the this value and policy function. From a traditional point of view, uh, if you want to really uh, write a very strong Go program, so what should we do is to hire a Go professional and then ask them to sit down and write all their intuitions. So once they have all these intuitions, you can put all the intuitions into the code and so that the, the, the bots can actually understand sort of the situation and then can act accordingly. But for this kind of approach, which is called traditional approach, usually, uh, it is very good at the beginning because uh, the professional player will, will give you like a, a lot of very important information there, but over time, uh, it will be uh, uh, not scalable. This is because uh, you can have like 100 rules uh, for your games, and for all these rules, there could be conflicting parameters, and they are very hard, it's very hard to actually tune them. So it also need very strong domain knowledge. So if you want to be a superhuman player, then you need to find a human, find a superhuman player to actually build it, which make it uh, impossible to do. But uh, on the uh, machine learning side, if we ha already have deep learning, so we actually change the paradigm completely by uh, enforcing an end-to-end -end training procedure. So in that procedure, instead of having a Go expert, what we can do is uh, we have a lot of data, and uh, we use the data to train a model so that uh, it will give you amazing performance. So previously, people were saying that this is not possible because the model was not complicated enough. But however, because of uh, the current advancement, we actually was able to do that, and we have shown that this uh, very interesting and amazing performance there. So for this, uh, uh, in under this like a big umbrella, uh, we have already done like interesting uh, works in these two direct directions. 
as a researcher, we are interested in like two directions. One is uh, we want to develop better algorithms and systems uh, given uh, the current resources. Okay. And uh, second is uh, we want to uh, develop better environment so that we can use less resources uh, to actually achieve a good performance. So here's like a, uh, two lines of the work. So I'm going to talk about uh, like uh, our Dark Forest Go engine. So I think uh, uh, people all know AlphaGo, uh, and uh, it's indeed that AlphaGo is much stronger in uh, that aspect. However, uh, we actually release our bots, our Dark Forest Go agent, that is three months before AlphaGo. We use like a z less than like one percent of the GPU compared to what DeepMind actually said. So in that uh, uh, Go uh, player, we actually can reach like a pretty strong performance, uh, and uh, um, other people in the on the internet actually enjoy it. That's basically the first boss that can show a very human-like move on the internet. So we actually open source the code and we get a pretty good performance on this. So this is the first part. And uh, for the second part of the work, uh, we actually have uh, trained a bot that can play this uh, 3D, uh, uh, 3D like a fighting game it's called uh, Doom. So this is a precursor of the previous uh, of the current game called, uh, for example, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, Counter Strike, right? So in this game, we actually see that the AI actually learns that how to dodge the opponent's oppo opponent's rocket, uh, given uh, the current situation, which is never taught by it uh, uh, by ourselves. So this is actually very interesting, and it's trained all end to end from the raw images. So here's some network structure, and I'm going to skip that because I only have like five minutes. Uh, so it's using other critical models and using curriculum training to train first on the simple maps and then transfer that to a bigger map that is actually used for the, for the competition. And we won the first place in uh, last year's competition in Vistum and uh, won by like uh, more than like 30% in terms of FRAX scores. So and uh, recently we also uh, work on this uh, platform called ELF. So this platform is an extensive, lightweight and flexible framework from the game research and uh, this platform is very useful if you want to put any games there so that it become multi-threaded and uh, it can run concurrently and efficiently. So based on this platform, we have a miniature version of mini uh, and real-time threaded game called the Mini RTS. And this game can run like 40K frame uh, per core. And if you can actually train a bot on this uh, uh, environment, and it will give you like a very interesting uh, tactics. So here's some uh, statistics showing that our, uh, our uh, environment is stronger and much more faster than our, the uh, other environments. So here's like a one, simple, uh, yeah, uh, one simple video showing that the bots who is actually on to the top left uh, can, was able to learn all these uh, uh, basic uh, tactics. For example, you first gather resources, you build barracks, you build a few units, and you, you can like counterattack. Okay, so you can basically counterattack the opponent's attack, and finally can win the game. Uh, so, uh, can the video be fast forwarded? Yes. Yeah, and you will see that the bots actually was able to find a strategy that can uh, actually attack uh, the opponents without being taught by humans step by step, and it can learn from end to end. So recently, we also have this uh, nice environment called uh, House 3D, and uh, it was a submission to this year's ICR paper. And uh, in this uh, House 3D environment, at the goal here, you try to navigate uh, from one places to other places uh, without any human intervention. And human only tell that uh, the bots need to go to the kitchen, and the bot will go to the kitchen in this virtual environment. So we use the same city data set that contains like 45K things, with uh, all kind of different uh, uh, houses. And in, the, in these houses, all, label, all objects are fully labeled. We turn this data set into an uh, 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 interactive environment so that the bots, the, the agent can actually move around. We actually provide a multimodality uh, for the agent to learn. So this modality include like depths, segmentation masks, and RGB images, and also top-down uh, views. So once we have this modality, we can actually uh, train a uh, neural network that can uh, give uh, give the agent, empower the agent so that it actually uh, do well in this virtual environment. And uh, finally, uh, we actually see that, uh, as shown in this first video, we show that the boss was able to move around uh, in, this, uh, in, uh, in the in outside and try to find where is the living room uh, in this uh, environment. 
by moving all the way inside. Yes, and then we see like uh, the bot actually find where it is. And uh, for the video to the right, the, we are able to show that the bot and can move around from this garage, and then find there's a door on the garage, and can can get into it, and uh, finally go to this living room, and finally you find the sofa and stop there. So you can see that uh, using like deep reinforcement learning, all this approach, all this uh, behavior from the bots can be learned automatically, given uh, the only the real world functions. So and, and this basically is a talk, and uh, I'm going to have a tutorial two days after, uh, which is in the afternoon of this Sunday. So in this tutorial, uh, we're going to talk about uh, AI and games, and also some basic knowledge of reinforcement learning and uh, advanced topics in reinforcement learning. Uh, and also uh, some case study, including AlphaGo and also our work. Uh, so if people are interested, welcome to join the tutorial. It, just, it will last like four hours. Uh, thanks. <laughs>